and welcome back to Crimes from the East. I'm your host Pia and with me is Alexa, stateside this time. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> What is this? Like the X Files theme with like Indian instruments? Yeah, it's my Bhangra version of the X Files. I'm in the hills. I'm in the spooky hills of Arizona, where I have seen something very much related to our topic today. So I'm I'm stoked. Was it Border Patrol? What have you seen out there? You know, shining, glowing, mysterious objects in the distance. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Yes. Today is going to be a non true crime episode. I felt like we did so many hard hitters over the last like four or five episodes. We did so many really difficult, tough and heinous crimes. I thought we need a little break. (gasps) We haven't talked about UFOs in a hot minute. It's so non brutal. It's barely even tangible. I mean, it's who even knows? What it even is. So I was like, perfect. We need this kind of vaporware <laughs> topic today. <laughs> yeah, we need we need a little um we need a little shower after our recent blood baths. Mm-mm-mm. Before that, tell me how life is going. Tell me what you've been up to. Well, uh, we're on the same continent for once. Hopefully soon we're gonna do a like real life reunion episode. Hey, I'm heading to the East Coast in a couple weeks. That's going to be awesome. But yeah, um, I'm in Arizona. It's hot. I've seen many animals in the wilderness, but no unidentified creatures or objects so far. Keeping my eye out, though. Nice. I must have talked about this last time because it's my only UFO story. The one and only UFO thing I've ever seen was here driving home into the hills. And I saw a big, basically bright light like a giant shooting star that was definitely on our planet, but not a plane. And it was falling like in a very straight line down behind the mountain of where I lived. Yeah. It's landed. It's come to get you, Alex. Yeah. How are you, Pia? You live with a little alien. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, my little alien keeps me on my toes. And speaking of her, I've been trying to teach her Hindi since she was born, really. We talked to her in Hindi at home. She understands it. She doesn't always speak it. So I'm trying to like teach her how to say certain words. And man, it's hard because I didn't realize how hard it is to say certain sounds in Hindi. Like we have a Mm -hmm. lot of hard syllables like duh, uh, duh. (laughs) you know, uh, yeah, yeah. She can't say any of it. Yeah, I can't. I mean, I can't say any of it. It's an absolute shame. She's still very little, so it's okay. I mean, she'll take time, but I'm hoping Mm -hmm. she'll learn. But right now, it's so funny. Like, can you say lurky? And she's like, lurky. 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 Little American A. Is she an ABCD? See, she's not confused. You know how she differentiates people? Huh? You are either Indian or you're regular. We went to this Indian restaurant for lunch a couple months ago and she looked around and she suddenly noticed everyone there is Indian. And she's like, mom, everyone here is Indian. Yeah, it's an Indian restaurant. People like to come eat here. And she's like, where are the regular people? What? What do you mean? We're not regular? (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) We're special. (laughs) That's what I'm going to take from it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Yep, we're special. Yeah, you know, it's always good to learn a new language. And in India, most people at least know three languages. They'll have their own mother tongue, like their regional language, because almost every state has its own language. Mm -hmm. Most people will also know some English and some Hindi. Not everyone speaks English and Hindi, but they'll know it because they learn it in school, right? So you at least learn three languages growing up in India, like involuntarily. And I think that helps a lot in like your brain development, like your cognitive skills and stuff. So that's great. Unfortunately, I think she's going to pick up like curse words first because I do curse a lot. (laughs) So she's going to pick up all the nice flowery Hindi curses. (laughs) That's about 
about it. I didn't do too much in the last couple of weeks. I think we're ready to get into our topic for today. Right, Alex? Yeah. Let's go. Let's so it. in our last episode on UFOs, we got Daisy with it. And we talked about some of the mysterious reports of strange crafts seen in the skies over South Asia. Today, we're going to continue on with that theme a little bit, kind of, and talk about a few more unexplained encounters in the region. Well, we'll focus mostly on the northeastern part of the Indian subcontinent today, basically the Kashmir area. Um, And we're going to talk about not exactly like true blue disc shape UFO sightings. We're going to talk about unexplained orbs and just weird things that happen in that area, okay? And I'm heavily relying on indiatoday.in for their excellent series of articles on this first sighting that we're going to talk about. Cool. As some people may have heard, the U.S. Senate had a couple of hearings on UFOs or UAPs as they now have rebranded them, reported in American airspace by both civilians and military personnel. One in 2021 and the other hearing was just last month. And although the hearing seemed like a bit of a farce, they didn't produce too much disclosure from the Pentagon, the Air Force or the military intelligence complex. What it did do is get the entire world talking openly about this long shunned and ridiculed topic. It's a lot less taboo now to talk about UFOs, and I am living and giving for this change, man, because damn, like, if I ever open my mouth, like, in front of people and I start talking about UFOs and aliens, they're like, hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and they, like, slide away, you know? Right. <laughs> now it's okay to talk about it. The Homer Simpson in the bush meme just disappearing awkwardly. <laughs> yeah, but now that the Pentagon is saying, oh, there may be UFOs, It's okay to talk about it, you know, because it's on the news. You could see it on the news, so it's not so bad. In Feb of this year, the U.S. Air Force shot down four mysterious airborne objects or UFOs. It was all over the news for like a month and then nothing. No news, zilch. Mm -hmm. Media doesn't care about it anymore, which is very suspicious because they refuse to release more information about what they shot down. Yeah, we never got a (sighs) follow-up. No follow-ups, just it's gone. We shot down some uh, weird stuff. Forget about it. (sighs) One of these four was allegedly a Chinese spy balloon. And that somehow floated all over South Carolina and was shot down by the Air Force. There were some pictures of the wreckage recovered from the Atlantic Ocean on that Chinese spy balloon. So technically, it's not a UFO. They know what it is. They said it's a Chinese spy balloon. But then there were at least three more publicly known UFOs noted all over North America and Canada, That, by the way, which were shot down by F-22 Raptors. These planes are expensive. It costs a lot of money to run them, to send them on these kind of missions. And each missile that they fire costs at least $400,000. Oh, my God. So they used at least at least three, maybe more missiles. To shoot these things down, okay? At least a couple million dollars have been spent on this. And the military says they don't know what they were. They have no pictures, no footage, no wreckage to recover. Like, bye-bye taxpayer money. We just blew it up. We have no accountability for this. Weird. This is why I don't think I need to pay my student loans back. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, don't do air, it, but... Alex. What's the point? They're just going to blow it up on missiles. Who cares? <laughs> I don't want to pay Trump's salary if he becomes president again. I definitely don't want to pay for missiles to just shoot birds out of the sky. And these poor UFOs, they're probably doing nothing. Have you ever heard of UFOs attacking anyone? No. They're just observing us, you know, doing whatever <laughs> right. scientific research. I mean... There are some stories about abductions and, you know, probings, but mostly I think it's just space tourism. These are tourists. Give them a visa. (laughs) Start charging them money. Like, don't shoot them with missiles. The thing is, all of this could just be super secret drone technology. In this day and age. Who knows? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's totally possible that some country has such advanced machinery for sure. 
But where did the technology come from, Pia? Where did the technology come from? They probably reverse engineered it from alien UFOs, which crash landed, I'm sure. At least in Roswell, if not like a bunch of other places. Right? I believe it. I believe in Roswell. I'm sure there was like an alien UFO crash then, for sure. I want to go. It's right next to you. It's next door to you, Alex. Walk over. I know. I should. (laughs) Go check it out. Obviously, countries like China or Russia are not going to reveal their best tech to the world, right? You want to save the best for your espionage and recon missions, just like all other countries do, right? UK, US, India, they all do the same. They, they're not going to reveal their best tech. But did such tech exist in 2012 or 2004? Probably, maybe, but highly unlikely. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's up to you. What do you believe your government is telling you? Do you believe what your government is telling you? Do you believe they've told you everything they've developed in the last 50 years? Yeah, and it's like the technology that we have as like normal everyday walking on the street human beings has probably existed for much longer than we've been able to access it. Having the technology and making it commercially available, I think that it could take a long time. Conceivably, it could. So who knows like what technology we're actually capable of versus what we know exists and what's been made like available to the everyday identifiable object, human. Everyday dum-dum. Keep that in mind when we talk about this next story because it could it could go either way based on that thought. Okay. Now, that year, 2012, several dozens of personnel from the Indian Army and Indo-Tibetan Border Police reported more than 100 sightings of UFOs in Ladakh, close to Pangongso Lake. Now, Ladakh is a region in Kashmir and the north of India. So this is like the northern most part of India. That little crown shape that you see on top of in- the Indian map, Ladakh is right there on the east side of it. So it touches Tibet on its eastern side. Mm-hmm. Now this sits right near the Indo-Tibetan border. And as we know, it is not claimed and occupied by China. So political and military tensions are very high in that area year round. So if you were to expect <laughs> weird Oh, yes, Pianar, spy, recon tech. This is the place. It would show okay. up. Yeah. Okay. If it shows up in Goa, that's weird. Like, <laughs> why the hell would China want to see a half-naked tourist on the beaches of Goa? That doesn't <laughs> make sense. That's probably a UFO. This could be anything. 50-50. That's exactly what a UFO wants to see. Half-naked tourists in Goa. Now, the Indian Army is equipped with good technology to spot, detect, and track drones. And they had, in fact, recorded 99 occurrences of Chinese drones in the area that year in 2011, okay? So it's not like they don't know, like, what's that? What's that in the sky? Like, no, (laughs) they knew exactly what a drone is. (laughs) They know what a drone is. It's the Indian (sighs) Army, for God's sake. Like, where do you think all your technology gets invented? Like, who are these engineers who make all this tech? They're Mostly Indians. I expect the Indian Army to have, you know, good equipment. Um, However, they also saw hundreds of unexplained orbs, glowing luminous yellow spheres that appeared to lift off from the horizon on the Chinese side and slowly traverse the sky for three to five hours before disappearing. Now, these were not unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, or even low-Earth orbiting satellites as per army officials, because they know what those look like. Yeah. Just to point out, like the highest end of consumer drones, commercially available consumer drones, today can only fly for approximately 30 minutes. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 20 minutes, 30 minutes max is what they can fly. So three to five hours just flying around, like traipsing about and then disappearing. Odd especially in 2011. Mm -hmm. Now, military drones can stay up, like the the top-of-the-line ones can stay up for Mm -hmm. almost 20 to 30 hours. Okay, 20, 30 hours. Okay. Today, a decade ago, maybe they were at two to three hours. Battery technology has 
evolved over time. However, we must also note that these types of long-range drones, they look like chubby planes. Yeah, they gotta carry their battery. They have wings and rudders and such. They're just unmanned robot planes, essentially. They should not appear like a glowing luminous orb. And also the way in which they fly is not like woo like a spiral. Like just, <laughs> you know, doing all kinds of gymnastics, Cirque du Soleil in the air. They don't operate like that. I really like your woo-woo sound. <laughs> woo <laughs> That's a good sound effect. Okay, so definitely sus. No easy explanation. The Indian Army, they moved a mobile ground-based radar unit and a spectrum analyzer that picks up frequencies emitted from any object to a mountaintop near that 160-kilometer long ribbon-shaped Pangong Lake. So they were curious. They're like, what are we seeing? If this is Chinese tech, we need to get on top of this, right? Mm -hmm. The radar that they had could not detect the object that was being tracked visually which was interpreted as it being non-metallic. They can see this object, but the radar can't, which means it's an organic thing, maybe, or kind of metal that doesn't exist on Earth, possibly, right? Mm -hmm. The spectrum analyzer could not detect any signals being emitted from them. Ooh. The Army also flew a reconnaissance drone in the direction of the floating object, but they learned nothing more. Their drone reached its maximum altitude and lost sight of the floating object because it was flying so high. Wow. Yeah, damn. Either it was otherworldly, like E.T. from Mars or, I know, Zeta Reticular or whatever, or like China has amazing technology that is centuries ahead of what India even has right now. Could it have been a stray helium balloon? <laughs> Well, then shame on the army if they can't even detect the goddamn helium balloon. <laughs> oh, man. A bird that has eaten a helium balloon by accident. This is just some freak event of, <laughs> you know, pollution needing nature. That has to be a giant bird. You know how large an object has to be for it to be visible in the sky? Yeah, jeez. Above, like, 500 feet you're not going to be able to see it oh my god that makes it really scary makes it definitely a bit a bit frightening and there have been so many sightings of these kind of lights all over the world and people differentiate this from say lights like headlights or lights on a plane they differentiate between them by saying that the light itself the nature of the light is totally like unseen they've never seen light like that before it doesn't seem like it's being emitted it seems like the object itself is light yeah yeah um it's like an organic light if that makes sense like pure glow we need to bottle it make a skincare line <laughs> like the butt of a firefly you know right in late September of 2012, a team of astronomers from the Indian Astronomical Observatory at Hanley. I don't know where this is. Where is Hanley? <laughs> uh, 150 kilometers south of the lake. Okay. So they're still in that area of Ladakh. They studied the airborne phenomena for three days. So they sent a team of astronomers, right? The army is like, uh, this is not a drone. This is not a military thing. Maybe it's a... Uh, meteorological astronomical phenomenon and they send astronomers to check it out i'm impressed that they're investigating this seriously yeah they successfully spotted these glowing orbs several times but they couldn't conclude or identify what they might be so again another team is completely stumped they did however say that the objects were non-celestial and they ruled out meteors and planets. So they're like, this is not the planet Venus, like every debunker likes to call UFO sightings. And it's not a meteor. Because meteors don't go up and down and round and fly around and zigzag and take 90 degree turns. Meteors follow a trajectory. You can predict the path of the meteor. This is not the first time the Ladakh region has had mysterious sightings in the sky. Even in 2004... 14 army soldiers reported sightings of glowing orbs and inexplicable lights zooming around in the sky. 
border patrol in the Siachen Valley in that area, which is also a very highly charged border area. Mm -hmm. There have been many battles fought there. Mm -hmm. They also reported similar UFOs. The Indian Air Force dismissed the Army's claims of UFOs simply as Chinese lanterns. <laughs> and as usual, we see this even in the U.S. The Air Force, Navy, and Army, they never get along. And they don't miss a chance to dismiss each other. They all have their own hidden agendas and they just want to one-up each other. And Well, if any of you guys, you, you big wigs, need... Need someone to come up with uh, good excuses for UFOs. You know that I am the one to come to with my floating bird helium balloon theories and such. Call me. It became a shameful thing to report these lights officially. So troops, they were ridiculed if they reported it. And they were called naive and gullible for falling for these Chinese psyops. Even though they couldn't prove that it was Chinese technology, they assumed that it was. And they said, listen, you're an idiot if you think this is anything else. You know, ignore it. They're just trying to get a rise out of you. Yeah. So people stopped reporting it, just like in the U.S. Ridicule, shame, that whole disinformation propaganda, it worked. Soldiers stopped reporting it. They were still seeing this. They were just not reporting it anymore. Even the 2012 Army Chief General N.C. Vidge, he angrily dismissed the reports as hallucinations. Um, I don't know. If you have mass hallucinations, like if 10 people are seeing the same thing, I think you're the hallucination for that object. For God's sake, it makes no sense. I've heard about like instances of mass hysteria. We have like the whole Salem witch trials thing. One theory is that it was just a case of like mass madness so that's a strange phenomenon that occurs but this is a visual confirmation that they're giving each other right yeah yeah, yeah. oh can you see that object oh yeah the one that's flying this way and now turning that way like yeah, yeah. it's that can be a hallucination those things don't happen so instantaneously there needs to be some build-up and some like yes ending into uh like you know a shared experience that might not really be real. But what is reality? No, we're not doing that. <laughs> and what would they gain from that? What would they gain from these hallucinations, like from reporting it? They would, in fact, be scared if they report it. Like, oh, uh, we don't want to be labeled crazy or whatever. Right. Or, or like, you know, maybe accused of drugs or something. You're not sharing your drugs with the supervisors? Off to jail with you. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so the military guys who deal with drones and planes apparently can't tell what they're looking at. Fine. Just like people still don't believe the Top Gun pilots of the U.S. Navy who saw the gimbal UFOs in the now leak videos from 2004, the ones you keep seeing on in the news. Those are Top Gun pilots who reported it. Some of the best pilots on this planet. And people still don't believe them. Who've seen shit. If anyone has experience. <laughs> fine. Don't believe the military. That's fine. How about scientists? The very people who are supposed to study this. Okay. Would you believe them? Would you believe scientists? I feel like they're the ones on the most drugs. The good stuff. The good stuff. Yeah. They can make their own LSD. <laughs> <laughs> In 2004, a five-member team of geologists and glaciologists. Glaciologists? Uh -huh. Scientists who study glaciers, basically, led by Dr. Anil Kulkarni of the ISRO, which is the Indian Space Research Organization uh, Center from Ahmedabad. They were on a research trip through the barren Samudra Tapu Valley in Himachal Pradesh. Now, this is the state right under Jammu Kashmir. So that northernmost part of India, the state that borders that state, Himachal Pradesh. Beautiful state. Okay. Just wonderful, wonderful. Let's go. This is a rocky mountainous valley with almost no trees, no shrubs, no habitation whatsoever. The only way to get to this valley is by hiking for eight hours from a famous lake called Chandratal Lake. We're going to talk about this later. Mm -hmm. And this is a somewhat popular and sacred lake where other mysterious phenomena is said to occur as well. And we'll talk about it just in a little bit. Okay. 
So yeah, after hiking for eight hours in like a barren valley, you get to this spot. So you can just imagine how remote this is and uninhabited it is. I want to go to there. Damn, like after we settled in the US, I found out so much about India and I'm like, God, I wish I was back in India so I could travel <laughs> to all these beautiful places. Now I have to spend like $5,000 to fly there and go see it. Just to go, yeah. On this research expedition, these glacial scientists and geologists were studying satellite data for the basin of the valley located 17,000 feet above sea level. It is very high up there. Okay, so there's some altitude, right? Yes, the air is thin. There's less oxygen than at sea level. There's nothing there to protect you from the elements. It's freezing cold. It is windy. It is sunny as well. So it's a harsh climate in that sense. So on September 27, 2004, the last day of their week-long study, at 6.45 a.m., one of the porters who helped carry all the luggage shouted out. He said, The snowman is coming! The snowman what? is coming! It's so funny. Like, where are you keeping your stash, dude? <laughs> <laughs> this is something my toddler would say. Like, Mama, the snowman is coming! <laughs> but yeah, that's a weird thing to hear. Like, if you're that scientist inside your tent in this barren valley with, like, not even a single tree. The snowman is coming? What? Is this turning into a Yeti? Is this turning into a Yeti episode? What's going on? So Anil Kulkarni, the senior ISRO scientist who had studied glaciers for more than 25 years. So he's an accomplished scientist just to establish that. He came out of his tent to inspect the commotion along with his teammates, SK Singh, Sunil Dhar and Rajesh Kalia. What they saw stunned them and made them question reality for a minute. They saw what appeared to be a humanoid robot-like figure floating a few inches above the ground, approaching the camp along the mountain slope. Now, Kulkarni and his co-researcher Sunil Dar pulled out their digital cameras and they began shooting the object as the team raced towards the mountain to investigate. They started taking pictures and they're running towards the snowman, which they described as an oblong object between three and four feet high. It kept moving down the slope towards the team. It had a cylindrical head with two balloon-type attachments on the side, a body, hands, and two legs. Wait, what? It seemed to be walking. Is it Mickey Mouse? This sounds more like the Pillsbury Doughboy to me. Two balloon-type attachments. A cylindrical head with two balloon-type attachments. It's Mickey Mouse. White Mickey Mouse. Ghost Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse in a Stormtrooper's outfit. Is it um, Papi Pedro? The Mandalorian was floating down the mountain. It's the Mandalorian. Stormtrooper Mickey Mouse had two legs. It was walking. Walking. It was planting and pacing its steps exactly like a human being. It's terrifying. This is what I think makes this a genuine experience or a genuine witnessing of something otherworldly. Because if it was a balloon, a balloon just bobs up and down, okay? Even if it's like a balloon shaped like a man, it's just going to like bob up and down, up and down, up and down, and that's it. But they can see the feet-shaped whatever appendages. Phalanges. Planting on the ground, like knees bending. It's like a monster. No, it's cute. I want to meet this thing. I'm not afraid of it. I want to go see it. Cute things that are not supposed to be somewhere are scary, though. No, no, no. No, no. Come on. Yeah, it's like if you were scuba diving and you turn around and suddenly, just to stay on theme, Mickey Mouse is there. That would be terrifying. Yes, Mickey Mouse in the ocean would be weird. I agree. So Mickey Mouse just in the middle of nowhere in the mountains? No, thank you. Pass. I will see you in (laughs) Disney, Mickey. Not in the mountains. Not here for that. Not in the mountains. All right. So 
might I add, they did say this thing was floating above the ground, almost like gravity didn't have an effect on it. You know what I mean? Like this is how maybe the astronauts walk on the moon. Right. It was like air swimming, air walking. The kind of walking you do in your dreams, you know, where you're trying so hard and you're barely making a a step. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. So when the object reached the bottom of the hill, it seemed to suddenly notice its audience of shock scientists a mere 150 feet away. So they got really close to it. It stood still for a few seconds, turned. Okay, it turned. And then started a steep 70 degree ascent towards the ridge top against the wind direction. So when it observed them, it turned and fled back up the mountain. Okay. Let me tell you, no goddamn weather balloon can do this. Especially because these scientists knew where they were. They knew exactly how to read their environment. Mm -hmm. They reported that it moved against the wind. Okay. This is not a balloon. Yeah, this is something with some muscle. By this time, apparently due to the rays of the sun, its color had changed to black. So it reacted to sunlight. The color changed to black. Imagine a white stormtrooper Mickey Mouse has now turned black. Okay, scary. But as it went back into the shadows, it turned white again. That means it's using solar energy for whatever it's doing because it's processing it, right? It's reacting to it. And it's like very sensitive to light too, maybe. The robotic object then hovered above the camp for a few minutes before silently receding into a white dot into the sky. So it flew away into the sky. What do you think, Alex? So I am really bad at distances and I don't have like a good concept in my mind of how far away 150 feet is. Like how much can you see of something that's 150 feet away with the naked eye. Because it doesn't sound like a lot to me, but it also sounds like maybe it's a lot. It's not a lot, actually. Like, people with generally good eyes or good glasses can't see that much. Not me, but other people can. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, what did it look like? I have some of the pictures, Alex. You don't (gasps) have to wonder anymore. Oh, my God. They took pictures. I wonder what it was up to. It was really disturbed by a human presence, too. Oh, what? It looks like a little jellyfish. It is kind of humanoid shape. That looks like an arm. Yeah. Those uh-huh. look like its feet. It looks like it's got some kind of a backpack. Maybe that's its head. You know what it reminds me of? Yeah? Little spirit creatures from Princess Mononoke, I think. Or one of the Miyazaki. They're like little wood sprites. Mm. one thing's for certain it is a physical object and that does not look like any balloon i've seen wow wow what is that that's like one foot it's bent and look the color seems to be changing on it oh man what is this does it have a bit of red on the top or is that just like me not seeing the photo very well these pictures are made for ants. They're like not even an inch tall. But this is what you had in 2004, I guess. So I'm not like holding it against them. It's kind of the question for me is like, why is it walking when it can fly? That means it was interested in something on that mountaintop. It was getting a closer look. Maybe looking for something, minerals, resources, a chipmunk to eat. I don't know. Yeah. But it definitely came close to inspect something. Did you see Nope? Mm Mm-hmm. I'm feeling the Nope vibes today. That was such a Mm. fun UFO movie for me. It was. It was totally different from any other sci-fi movie ever made. It was very interesting. So this could be something like that. Is this an, Mm -hmm. an organic being that just exists in our world? We just don't know about it because it's good at hiding, maybe. Maybe it was the Yeti. Super Yeti. Or was this like a recon mission and he came out of a UFO and was looking for something on the ground? Yeah. I wonder how the scientists are today. Now, could this have been just a balloon caught in the wind? No, the scientists did not think so. 
One of the geologists, Rajesh Kalia, thought that it didn't look like a man-made object at all. So even like their perception of the shape of it, the look of it, and the way it moved seemed off to them. Like, you know, your eyes can tell when something's not right. Yeah. He got that feeling this wasn't a man-made object at all. And I believe them because they are scientists, right? They've got a rational mind. They're not easily persuaded into believing things. These guys were probably the best witnesses that one could have asked for for a sighting like this because they can right. analyze everything that they're looking at. For sure. In an effort to rationally examine their sighting and investigate its technological feasibility, two of the witness scientists, Sunil Dhar and Anil Kulkarni, they contacted several advanced robotic labs all around the world to get an idea of how far robotics had come and if such an unmanned rocket man could be human-made technology. Mm -hmm. This is what a scientist would do. They would mm -hmm. study their sighting and that's what they did. They wanted to find out if this is just some prototype being tested out in this barren valley and they found no such evidence. They found that we still don't have any technology that can so effortlessly maneuver all over a steep rocky mountain slope like that and then fly off into the sky. It does not exist. Even today, I mean publicly, definitely not in 2004. We couldn't have asked for better witnesses for this uh, stormtrooper Mickey Mouse. Yeah, trained observers basically. Now, the government and military simply filed the sighting away and really couldn't do much about it owing to the remote location and how inaccessible it is for most of the year. It's covered in snow. It's freezing. It's cold. Now, the entire area, this entire region of northeastern Kashmir is mystic. It's sacred to people and it is plunged in tales of otherworldly sightings. Now, let's talk about the Chandratal Lake that we mentioned earlier or Moon Lake, Lake of the Moon. It is near the same Samudra Tapu Valley that the humanoid UFO was seen, but it is in the state of Himachal Pradesh. So the neighbor. It's like a couple hundred kilometers away. This beautiful crescent-shaped lake and its surrounding valleys in the lap of the Himalayas are stunning. Despite being somewhat barren, it is majestic and bound to inspire you to introspect and reflect on life. People make the long and dangerous journey here to marvel at the night sky, where you can see the Milky Way with astounding clarity. Okay. Locals believe that fairies descend from the skies and frolic in the lake at night. Oh. Now, this lake is a crater lake formed by meteor impact, and many people have sighted glowing orbs flying around here. And that's why they have these stories of fairies descending and frolicking here in the night. A travel blogger from India posted a video detailing his group sighting in 2015 right by this lake. Ronnie and Bardi is the channel's name on YouTube. At noon on a bright sunny afternoon, they were sunbathing outside their tents next to the lake and they saw a white balloon-like object, maybe 10-15 feet in diameter, flying above the lake before them, so not too far away. As they traced the path of the balloon, it kept getting closer to them and descending towards the bottom of the hills where they were laying. Within a minute or so, the object rapidly descended into an outcrop. It swooped and swirled in motion and it vanished into the rocks. Okay, now Ronnie and his friends, they ran to the spot and they searched among the rocks and barren grassland, but found absolutely nothing. The mysterious object had disappeared as if by magic. Wow. So what the hell was it? Even if it was nothing more than a weather balloon, they would have found evidence of it, right? Where would it go? Like I said, there are no trees here. It's all barren, flat, just full of rocks and like maybe an inch of grass. They would have seen yeah. a deflated balloon lying on the ground. Right. Couldn't find a single thing. And multiple people witnessed this. So at least five of his friends saw this. Again, not a hallucination. It was a physical object flying towards them, disappeared into the ground. The mystery is in its bleeping out of our plane of existence. That's the mystery, right? Now, seeing objects, yeah. it could be anything. Right. But usually you see it come and you see it go. Yeah. 
still pretty freaking mysterious, but it zapped out of our world. <laughs> it just bleeped yeah. out. Bleep. Pia, here's my theory. Yeah, go ahead. It mm -hmm. was a bubble. A 10 foot long bubble? You know, some like soap factory exploded. One stray bubble caught in the wind. Where? In the Himalayas? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, a really big one. And of the millions of bubbles, one survived, got to this point, and, it, you know, made its final descent before popping. Okay, sure. <laughs> See, CIA, call me. I'm full of ideas. I've got an explanation for every single event. Mystery solved, I guess. You know, we're just solving things left, right, and center today. What a life. I mean... Okay. Now, these objects are either completely unaffected by our presence, or they deliberately make themselves seen by people. One thing is common. Afterwards, the witnesses never forget this. They are forever changed. They are left with millions of unanswered questions and wondrous awe for this world. They are unsettled when they see things like this. Now, if you think that these two spots are magnets for UFOs and orbs, I've got another one for you, Alex. The sacred Mansarovar Lake, which is also in this general area. This entire region, just mysterious and strange. Spooky dooky town, yeah. I want to go, and I want to see some orbs and aliens, and I want to, I don't know, ride a donkey. How are your lungs, by the way? <laughs> are you got strong lungs? Because you definitely need them in this in this area. It's like fifteen thousand feet above sea level. They have, I think, like sixty percent oxygen. Oh my god! Very I tiring. Mean, we do have a family of history of asthma, don't we? <laughs> so probably mm. could be better. Could be worse. I know I won't make it as much as I want to. Yeah, I have the lungs of a sparrow. I can't do this. I know. I think everyone's just tripping balls from altitude. That's what's really going on here. That's the thing. Alone? Yes, I agree. That's possible. Group sightings? That alone is a phenomenon. If they have a group hallucination, maybe that's the phenomenon we should be studying. Not so much the object they're seeing. Yeah. But the fact that they can share a visual experience that doesn't exist. Maybe that's the phenomenon. Okay, Mansarovar Lake is a high-altitude freshwater lake fed by the Kailash Glacier next to ultimate supreme of all mountains in India. Well, wait a minute. This is not in India, but for India. <laughs> Mount Kailash. Oh. This is one of the most sacred mountains for Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, and Bon people of the world. Mount Kailash is considered to be the abode of Lord Shiva wow. and his wife, Goddess Parvati, where he sits in perpetual meditation. So Shiva is apparently the only god who resides on planet Earth. The other gods, the creator and the... Perpetuator. Perpetuator, yeah. So Brahma and Vishnu don't live on Earth. They live in their own planes Okay. Shiva is the only god who lives on earth, apparently in Mount Kailash. He's supposed to be in perpetual meditation there. And if he ever wakes up from that meditation, we are dead because he will destroy the universe. He is the destroyer. Right. If he wakes up, yeah. he's going to do his Tandav dance and lights out for all of us. We're dead. Damn. So if you plan okay. to go up near this mountain, be very, very quiet. 